Welcome to New Vintage Church and welcome to week number four uh, in our series through the book of 2 Timothy called Your Time Has Come. And just a little disclaimer here, that title is not quite as fatalistic as it sounds, right? I'm not saying that your, your time, you're all about to die. That's not what I'm trying to say. Um, what I'm trying to say is your time has come to pick up where others have left off in terms of preaching the gospel uh, to, to those who need to hear it. And basically take that baton and run the race uh, that those who ran before us have run. They're handing it off to us and then we're supposed to hand that baton on to the next generation because that's what the church is meant to do. We are called to pass on the knowledge and, and the gift of Jesus Christ uh, to every generation and so on and so forth. So that's what we mean by your time has come. It's about your time has come to take responsibility for getting the word of God into the hands of the next generation and the people in your lives. So the book of 2 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. Uh, Not just in prison, he was on death row. And this letter to Timothy is actually the last known letter uh, written by Paul before he was executed. Uh, And this was basically a farewell letter. Uh, to, to this man named Timothy because he knew death was imminent. So he writes, he writes this letter to Timothy, uh, who was a young pastor in Ephesus at the time, uh, who had been ministering there in Ephesus uh, for over four years at this point in time. And before that, Timothy had been a faithful uh, servant of Paul. In fact, Timothy had ministered alongside Paul uh, during the duration of both the second and third missionary journeys that is recorded in the book of Acts. Now, we know that Paul and Timothy were very, very close, and it's important to understand that Paul was like a father to Timothy. He was his mentor for over 10 years, uh, his mentor in ministry, and and really probably just a father to him in everyday life situations at times as well. So he was a source of encouragement to Timothy throughout the years, and you can tell that this letter Paul is really encouraging Timothy to lean in on the word of God, lean in on the scriptures of God, and lean on, on the same path that, Timothy, or that, that Paul had led him on uh, throughout the years. Paul was encouraging and instructing Timothy uh, for when he would soon be gone. On that note, we're going to look at a very influential passage from this letter, so I'm going to ask you all to stand up. And uh, we're going to go ahead and read through our memory verse through this series, which is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Uh, And this passage really shows us the importance and the authority of God's word and of scripture. So if you would read along with me, it's the ESV translation. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All right, you all can have a seat. Thank you. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to the book of 2 Timothy once again. Uh, We're going to go to chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 14. 2 Timothy is sandwiched right between 1 Timothy and the book of Titus. Uh, But as you're turning there, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, Serena and I, right before we got married, we were engaged for about a year. Uh, And I could stand up here and tell you that that year was the most magical, most beautiful, romantic, wonderful time of our entire lives, right? We showed each other our love for one another. We whispered sweet nothings all the time. Everything was perfect every hour of every day. But if I said that, I'd be lying through my teeth. Uh, If you ask Serena or I, either one, we would both tell you that that was one of the most miserable years of our entire lives. Our engagement was terrible. We fought constantly. Uh, We always argued. And if you wouldn't know any better, you'd probably thought we hated each other, to be honest. We just bickered all the time. It was terrible. And I have to laugh when people are like, the first year of marriage is always the worst. And Serena and I can watch and be like, yeah, we went through that when we were engaged. Like, we got through that. We're over that, right? The engagement was way worse than the first year of marriage. And the reason the engagement was so rough was because of a couple of things. First off, uh, we hadn't learned really to communicate with one another yet uh, or how to compromise. 
But most importantly, we both had different ideas as to what our future was going to look like when we were married, right? We both had unspoken expectations for one another. And I remember one day we were in the kitchen with her mom and we start bickering about something. It was obviously very, very important. And we were bickering and her mom just kind of turns to us and she's like, you guys realize you bicker about everything all the time? which turned into another argument as to whose fault that was, right? That we bicker all the time. But her mom finally just turned around and looked at us and she's like, you guys really just need to learn to pick your battles. You ever heard that before? Pick your battles? In other words, stop wasting your time and energy on the things that aren't going to be beneficial in the end, right? Save your energy for the issues that matter. Stop focusing on the things that that have no value, you're not just trying to win an argument, focus on the issues that in the end are going to build and strengthen your relationship. Sometimes the toughest battles of all are the ones where we have to uh, get over ourselves and keep our mouths shut. That's one of the hardest things for me, just keeping my mouth shut. Sometimes I have something that I think needs to be heard, but it doesn't. Pick your battles. That's the title of my message this morning. Pick your battles. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to pick my battles. <laughs> you got to pick your battles, Anna. You got to. Because the truth is, when we waste our time and we waste our energy quarreling over stupid things, it often creates division. It creates bitterness. Uh, and when it comes to spiritual things, it can be very, very harmful to the faith of those around us. So pick your battles. It's important. Think before you speak. If it needs to be said, then say it, but do it in an orderly way. Do it in a godly fashion, a godly manner, and make sure that it's a God-honoring conversation. And this is something that that Paul feels uh, the need to address, and it's not just one of those things that he mentions just once, but he mentions it several times. He just keeps coming back to this issue. Uh, So let me pray before we get into the Word of God. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your Word. I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts, open our minds to to hear and receive what you you have for us today. We know that your word is always true, that it is life. So, Father, as, as we hear it read today and as we ponder it and think about it, we just ask that you would slowly be changing us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so 2 Timothy 2.14 says, remind them of these things. Now, that's in reference to what we talked about last week, what Paul was talking uh, about when he reminded Paul of the, uh, I'm sorry, Timothy, of the essential truths of the gospel. Uh, So he says, remind them of what's important, basically. Remind them of what's important and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Now, this was not just a friendly request uh, this isn't just one of those, hey, Timothy, if you get some time, maybe you ought to remind the people there you know, not to argue, argue about you know, empty words, stupid things. No, this was definitely a command. This was serious business. He actually said to charge them before God. In other words, instruct them in the presence of God. Let God be your witness that you have instructed these people not to quarrel and argue over Words. And why is it so important? Because it does no good. It has no benefit. In fact, it says that it ruins the hearers. It's destructive, right? It's destructive to those who are listening. It's even destructive to those who are arguing and bickering. As believers, we're called to strive for unity. That's what we, that's the goal together, not division and discord. Paul actually mentions this in his first letter to the Corinthians church. He says, But dear brothers, I beg you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to stop arguing among yourselves. Let there be real harmony, a.k.a. unity, so that there won't be splits in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So it's okay to have different opinions, right? It's okay to disagree with someone. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is not okay to ruin the faith of those around you by creating division in God's church. That's dangerous. 
Jesus died for his church. We are the bride of Christ. And his whole purpose was of uniting us as one. Unity. Keeping of one mind. United in thought and purpose. That's the goal. That's far more important than proving that our view is the right view all the time. I'm sure you're probably thinking, now, David, aren't we supposed to stand up for what we believe and and defend the truth? Yes, absolutely. But we need to realize that there's a difference between defending the truth and just quarreling and arguing over empty words. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. He says, remember what's important, the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's important. If you remember that that is what matters, then all the other things are going to be secondary. And they're not worth arguing about in the long run. It's okay to have a discussion with a close friend, but if it's getting heated, there's no point. Don't waste your time. Don't let the other stuff distract you from what matters. In other words, as a leader in the church, yes, Timothy needs to make sure that the church stands for the truth. But it doesn't mean that it should be a debating society, right? Because it only causes division. So pick your battles. Focus on what matters. So Paul's basically saying strive for unity, right? Strive for unity. He says don't get distracted by pointless arguments and be sure to teach your people. Teach the congregation those same things. Then he says this. In in verse 15, he says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's heavy. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Listen, church. The only approval you need, the only approval that matters, is God's approval in your life. That's the only approval that is eternal, that matters in the end. And until we understand that, we're always going to be seeking the approval of other people for our self-worth. Uh, we're going we're to let others determine the things that we do in life. We're going to let them control our decisions that we make because we all want approval, let's be honest. We all want to be approved. We want to hear that we've done well, right? We were created with this desire inside of us to please God. That's natural. But when we get distracted and when we lose focus of what's important, then we're going to start seeking approval from an outside source, from something different, someone other than God. Paul's saying to Timothy, he's saying, dude, don't seek the approval of men. Don't seek the approval of people. Seek the approval of the Almighty God. That's what matters. If making decisions to make people happy is your goal, then making them happy is the only reward that's going to come out of it. It's not always beneficial to make people happy. So make sure that with everything inside of you, to the best of your ability, seek the approval of your Heavenly Father. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. Have you ever been ashamed of your work uh, when the time comes for it to be examined or to be checked? I have. Uh, It's embarrassing It's very embarrassing when you're told it isn't good enough uh, or that you didn't reach the expectations that were set. This isn't referring to making mistakes, right? We all make mistakes. We're all going to mess up. Even the best workers make mistakes. This is referring to someone who just didn't care enough about the work to give it their best. They didn't give it their all. When I was really young, this dude at our church, he owned a tree stand company, Uh, where he built and sold tree stands uh, for hunting. And he offered me, along with my friend Zach, a job. Actually, he offered it to Zach, and Zach kind of referred me, and I got the job too. Uh, But really what we had to do was we had to take these a hot glue gun, and we had to glue two doll rods on the ends of a piece of basically camouflage fabric. And to this day, I still don't know what they were. I don't know why he needed them or why he needed so many of them. Uh, But like I said... I was, I was very young at the time. I think he was paying us 50 cents for every one we made. And uh, to be honest, I think I only took the job because I thought I was going to be spending a lot of time with Zach, right? Oh, this would just be a great time. Well, I never got to work with Zach. 
Uh, he would always work before, and then I would come in. Uh, but anyway, I remember being really, really bored since I was there alone. Even, even the, the owner was in his house, and I was out in his shop making these things. Uh, I've gotten better over the years, but I am not a detailed person. Something tedious is not my forte. I hate tedious, especially if it's visual. I'm the last person you want to help paint your house. I'm the last person you want to help do your landscaping. I, it's just, it's relative to me. It's just all relative, right? And I know this is going to shock you, but, you know, looks never really were that important to me growing up. Tedious things, just, I struggle with them, right? It just never came natural to me. Uh, but I remember when my new boss came out to see how well I'd done, he wasn't really impressed with how many I had produced, uh, and it was even less impressed with the quality of the ones that I had produced. And uh, the weird thing was he actually got out the ones that Zach had made earlier and compared his to mine and showed me how bad mine were. And actually, he never needed me to come back. I don't know why. Zach kept going back, but I never got to go back. It was embarrassing. I knew why I didn't get to go back. Because what it really came down to was I didn't really give it much. I didn't care, right? I was a worker who was very ashamed of my work in the end. And for Timothy, this was far more important than doll rods and, and camouflage fabric, right? This is the word of God. This is the gospel. The souls of people are at stake here. And if, if there's any job out there that we don't want to uh, be ashamed of, it's the work that we do for the Lord. We don't want to be ashamed of that. Our work will be examined. The Bible tells us that. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear the words, well done. That's the goal. That's what I want to hear. When I stand face to face with my Savior, I want to hear him say, well done. And I want to know that he was pleased with the job that I did. And Paul says that the way to do that is to rightly handle the word of truth. The word handle can be translated into the word manage. So Timothy is called to rightly manage the word of truth. And the truth is, we need to understand that biblical truth is not just an issue left up to everyone's interpretation, right? It's not just a free-for-all. Because there is a right way and a wrong way to interpret and understand the word of God. And a pastor especially has to work very, very hard to, to be sure that he is giving the proper interpretation of God's word. And as your pastor, when I come up here to deliver a message, I promise you I'm giving it my all. I'm giving it my best. Uh, I'm trying to interpret the word of God to the best of my ability, and I have to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to do the rest, right? But here's the thing. I know I've said things, and I know I will say things that might be off mark once in a while, it might be off base. I'm going to mess up. I'm human. I'm a work in progress, just like the rest of us. But just like everyone else in this room, the truth is we all want to interpret the word of God correctly. That's what we want to hear. And if I'm coming up here with the intent to impress you or the intent to entertain you or, or show you how much I know, which really isn't that much, but if that's my goal, then I'm seeking the approval in the wrong areas, right? And to say this in the nicest way, I don't need your approval. I want your approval. I like to hear that I've done well, but I'm not doing it to hear attaboy, right? We do this because we want to seek the approval of God. We want to make sure that we are interpreting his word correctly, and I'm going to do that with the best of my ability. I'm seeking the approval of God, not the approval of man. And that's what he's trying to say. If you're seeking the approval of man, then you will definitely mishandle the word of truth. And this is what Paul's trying to get across to Timothy here. And it's interesting how what he said here is sandwiched right between two statements about not getting caught up in arguments over the things that, that take our focus off of what matters. Because he says this next. He says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And their, their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, 
And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So Paul's thought process has not changed. He's still implying that we need to stay away from and shun these, these ideas of arguments and irreverent babble. He says that it leads to ungodliness. He doesn't say that it might lead. It actually says it will lead to ungodliness. The Bible says that the tongue has the power of life and death in it. And that's a lot of power. <laughs> it's a lot of power. What we say can build up or tear down. What we say can guide or mislead. So we need to be conscious of the words that we speak. We shouldn't just be throwing them around. Jesus actually says this. He says, and I tell you this, that you must give account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. That scares me to death. Because if you've ever spent more than 10 minutes with me, you know I say a lot of stupid things. Especially when things get quiet and awkward. Somebody's got to say something, and it's usually not the right thing. But an idle word is basically a word that has no purpose, right? It's, it's an empty and pointless word. It has no value. And really, that's what Paul is trying to say here. He's trying to say that what you say, it matters to God. What you say matters to God. Because what we say impacts the people around us, but it also says a lot about our sense of self-control in our lives. Someone who rightly handles the word of truth should avoid pointless arguments and irreverent babble. This is why we should avoid gossip and flattery, uh, immoral talk, things, things that have no benefit. And not only that, not only should we avoid it, but we should actually hold others accountable not to do it as well. Because if we don't, it will spread like gangrene. That's a good word picture there. If you don't know what gangrene is, it's like a deteriorating disease. It eats away at the, at the flesh and rots, usually a result from bacterial infection. So he's implying that these conversations are harmful and they will spread like an infectious disease. So he says, don't take part in it. It's not important. Put a stop to it when it happens. And then he gives an example of these two guys named Hymenus and Philetus. And yes, I had to Google how to pronounce those. In the midst of this pointless babble, they lost sight of the truth and they began leading others astray with a complete lie, something that was contrary to the gospel. And he says the worst part is that it's confusing the faith of those who believe their lies. He's saying that those two men did not rightly handle the word of truth because they took their focus off of what matters, the gospel, the simple message of the cross. You can tell that Paul's very upset over the division that these two men had caused, and it's almost like he's just throwing his hands up in the air and saying, all right, it's in God's hands. I don't know why these, why these two men would do what they have done, but it's not for me to say who's in and who's out, right? And he says, it's not for me to say who belongs to God or not. That's not my place. That's God's place. But the one thing Paul can say for certain is that those who do belong to God, they don't just embrace sin. They don't just willingly continue in it. They abandon it. And when they're corrected, they change their ways. Here's the thing. People who call themselves followers of Jesus should be leaving sin behind. We should be. It's just a part of the process, right? We're trying to be more and more like Christ. There was a time when Jesus defended this woman who was caught in adultery. And he told her, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. But you know what he didn't say? Your sins are forgiven. Now keep doing what you're doing, right? Right? We are called to leave the old things behind when we come to Jesus. And I would assume that these two men had been warned uh, that they were leading people astray and they didn't care. And Paul's saying, this is what happens when people get caught up in this pointless, irreverent babble and these arguments that, that have no value. It's destructive and you have to pick your battles. 
Be careful. Is it worth getting involved in this rather appealing kind of talk? Let's admit, usually the things that don't matter are the things that they're most appealing to argue about. Is it going to take our focus off of Jesus and lead us astray? And I love what he says next because it paints such a good picture of being used by God. He says this in verse 20. He says, Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. I want you to think of the great house that Paul is referring to as the church, the people of God. And he says that in this great house, there are many different kinds of vessels. The vessel is just basically a shallow bowl, right? And he says some vessels are used for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. Now, let's be honest. None of us want to be a vessel uh, that's used for dishonorable use, right? We all want to be used for honorable things. We don't want to be the garbage can or the, the ashtray, right? Especially in terms of, of God. Because we want to be the very best vessels in the house. We want to be used when there are great banquets, when they have the highest honored guests come over. We want to be the vessels used for that, right? For the greatest things. And the best part is that the possibility is in our hands. Because he says, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. Now, it's important to understand that Paul is not talking about an overall cleansing of sin, right? Because we can't do that ourselves. Uh, that was done on the cross. That was accomplished when Jesus died for us on the cross. The blood of Jesus is the only thing uh, that can cleanse us and forgive us from all unrighteousness, right? What was done, that was all done through the work of Jesus. But this cleansing that Paul is referring to is another aspect of cleansing, uh, which God looks for us to do with participation of our own will and effort. Now, it's not that we can do anything apart from God, really, but it's a work that awaits our effort, it says, if anyone cleanses himself. See, the aspect of cleansing is mostly, this aspect is mostly connected with usefulness and service for God and having a closeness with God. But what does it mean to cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable? Well, a dishonorable thing is anything that doesn't bring honor or glory to God, right? Things such as arguing and division, which Paul has uh, talked about quite a bit here, um, but not only those things, it can, it can be anything that is sinful, right? Lust, greed, pride, fear, anger. Paul's saying that if we will try our best to cleanse ourselves of the things in our lives that have no benefit, and sin has no benefit, the only thing sin does is brings us death, right? Death and destruction. So if we will clean these things out of our lives, we will be useful for our master. I love that. Because we will be focused on what matters and we will be used for greater things. And that's what I desperately want. As a follower of Jesus, I want to be used by God in the most honorable ways. I want to make sure that I'm a clean vessel. The cleaner you are, the greater the job you'll get. Let's be honest. When you're ready to serve food at your own house... Uh, we expect to pull out a dish that is clean, right? If it's not clean, we aren't going to use it for the clean food that we just prepared, right? Maybe we'll throw some scraps in it before we wash it. But my point is, if it's not clean, then it's not ready, right? It's not ready for use. And we're all called as followers of Jesus to be ready for every good work, and I wonder how many of us in here are ready to be used for every good work. Are you ready? Everybody say, I'm ready. A few of you are ready. How do we cleanse ourselves from these dishonorable things? Paul gives us the answer to that question in verse 22 by giving us two very practical steps. He says this, 
uh, in verse 22. So flee youthful passions. To flee from something means to run from it, to get as far away from it as possible. When it comes to picking your battles, this is one that you choose to run from. Right? It's, it's not worth trying to fight it. Just get away from it. Run as fast as you can. So he says, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. Along with, that would refer to beside someone else or uh, in the presence of someone else, those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, a.k.a. other believers. This is what I love about God's word. It's so practical in its application. It doesn't just tell you to do something without giving you a way to do it. He says, if you want to cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable, the first step is to flee from youthful passions. You need to run away from youthful passions, which can be a number of different things. Uh, but let's be honest, Paul's writing to a very young man here. Uh, and the biggest struggle for most young men are lustful thoughts and temptations. That's just, I mean, that's inevitable. This is an epidemic in our world today, and it's very, very embraced. We have pornography at our fingertips with our phones now. Uh, it's posted everywhere you go. And sadly, the statistics of people in the church struggling with pornography isn't a whole lot better than people outside the church who struggle with pornography. And I know this is always a topic where it gets real quiet. But here's the thing. Sexual sin is one of the greatest temptations for young men, not just young men, Men of all ages. And it's not exclusive to just men anymore. Women also struggle with it nowadays. It's become a struggle for all of us. But the truth is, uh, it's been this way since the beginning of time, right? Sexual sin, pride, and the desire for power, they've been the downfall of mankind from the beginning. And Paul's saying, just run away from it. Don't even try to deal with it. Just run. I love how Charles Spurgeon says it. He says this about youthful passions. He says, run away from them. It is no use contending with them. Fight with the devil, resist the devil, and make him flee, but never fight with the flesh. Run away from that. The only way to avoid the lust of the flesh is to keep out of its way. If you subject yourself to carnal temptations and fleshly lusts, remember, it is almost certain that you will be overcome by them. I love that. When temptation comes, get the heck out of Dodge. Run. When a storm is coming, you don't try to stop it. It'd be pointless. You run for cover. You go somewhere safe. You get away from it, right? So the first step is to flee from youthful passions, away from these fleshly desires. And the second step is to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with other believers. Notice that he says, run away from the temptation. And how do you do that? By pursuing righteousness. Not only righteousness, but righteousness with other believers, other Christian people. It's not enough to just run from the danger. You need to run to a safe place, pursue safety, get away from it. If you're struggling with something that is dishonorable, if you're battling something that you just can't seem to shake, you won't overcome it without pursuing something else to replace it. It's important that you replace it with godly things and that you pursue those godly things with godly people. People who are going to hold you accountable when you need it. It's not a one-step process. It's a two-step process. Run away from it. Run toward godly things and godly people. It's very important. Paul gives Timothy this advice on how to be useful for the work of God. And then he brings it right back to this idea of staying away from arguments and quarrels. Because all in all, this has been his main point in this section of Scripture. The whole time is to pick your battles, focus on the things that matter. And he says this. He says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. It's the third time he mentions stay away from those things. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. I love that. Because that implies that 
even when we try to correct someone, that he's not supposed to do it in an argumentative way, but in a gentle way. In a way that would bring someone else to, to the knowledge of Christ, not just to win an argument. Because in the end, it's not about Timothy's opinion, whether it's right or wrong. It's about the word of truth. So he says, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I understand that some people are just uh, more confrontational than others, and it can be fun to debate certain opinions. But we have to remember that in the end, there's only one thing that matters. And that's who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us. He loved us so much that he shed his precious blood on a cross to save us from, the sin, from our sins. He died for the entire world. That's the one thing that is worth arguing for. Because if someone says anything differently than that... That's a battle worth fighting. But all the other stuff, it's all relative. There might be some importance to it, but it's not the main thing for us to focus on. See, Paul said that the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. And here's the honest truth. If you're a follower of Christ, then Christ is your Lord. Christ is your master and you are his servant. This is not specific to pastors only. Yes, pastors should take this above and beyond. All Christians are servants to Jesus. And servants of Jesus should not be quarrelsome. Because our focus should not be about whether we have all the right answers. That's human desire. That's not what we're supposed to worry about. It shouldn't be about whether we agree with someone's opinion what matters is if someone knows who Jesus is and what he's done for them. My mentor back home in Ohio, the pastor that I served under for over six years, he taught me a lot. Uh, I have the utmost respect for him. I love him, and I'm so grateful for him. But that doesn't mean that I have agreed with every single thing that he's said, right? He's my mentor. I trust him, but I'm allowed to have differing opinions, but I would never have argued or quarreled with him over these things because it didn't matter. What mattered was that we were trying to bring people into the kingdom of heaven. That's what matters. That was the focus together. It's okay to have differing opinions. See, I personally, I don't like to argue about anything theological if it's not a salvation issue. I like to sit down and talk. That's fine but I'm not going to argue with you and get mad over it. I believe that Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life, and no man comes to him except through the Father. And I will defend that truth all day long. But I don't want to get distracted by all the other things because those things only cause division in the end. It's destructive, and I, I don't want to lose sight of the simple things, the simple message of Jesus on the cross. I mean, seriously, what's more important? Proving that our political view is the right view or gently loving someone into the kingdom of God? Or what's more important? Proving that our theological view is more sound than someone else's or making sure that everyone you know has heard that simple message that Jesus died for them. He forgave their sins. You gotta pick your battles. What's really important? Proving somebody wrong, it doesn't really benefit anybody except you. The question is, will someone get closer to Jesus because of this debate? Three different times Paul says, stay away from these pointless conversations. First he said, charge them not to quarrel about words. Then he said, avoid irreverent babble. And lastly he said, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Paul's telling Timothy that as a leader, you have to learn to pick your battles. Make sure that the souls of lost people are your main concern. Because that's what matters. 
When someone is living in sin, are you trying to correct them because you want to prove to them that you know this is wrong? Or are you trying to correct them because you care about their well-being and you want to see them living a life of freedom? Pick your battles. He's saying stay focused on what matters. In closing, I just want to encourage you, focus on what matters. Focus on the important things. Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom and what God wants. Then all the other needs will be met as well. He wants everyone to turn their heart to Jesus. That's what God wants. So that no one would perish. God is in the business of saving people. Not arguing about stupid theories and things that take our focus off of him. That being said, I, I want to encourage, Growth Sunday is next week. And as you know, the sole purpose of Growth Sunday is to grow God's church. Not New Vintage Church, but God's church. To bring people into the kingdom of God. Because we truly believe that if we're not focused on sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with the world around us, then we're focused on the wrong things. People matter to God. So I want to encourage you to go above and beyond this week. Invite people next week to Growth Sunday. They're going to hear the message of Jesus Christ, and then we're going to go to a park and we're going to just hang out, break bread together, maybe bring a guitar and sing. I don't know. I'm just off the top of my head. But I know we're going to play some yard games out there. We're just going to have some time of fellowship, and that's very important for God's people. Bring people to church next week. Be thinking about who you can invite Not just because David says you should, but because the Bible says that growing God's church is important. So let's not focus on ourselves and what we can get out of this, but let's focus on on letting others experience the freedom in Christ as well. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you that you are good. Thank you, God, that you have given us... uh, A spirit not of fear, but of love and power and of self-control. And Father, that self-control also pertains to our tongue, what we say, what we allow ourselves to to say and, and, and even hear, Father. I just pray that you would that you would guide us and that we would be people who are discerning as to what's important, that we would pick our battles, Father. Is it important to argue about? And if it is, why? We thank you for your word, God. I pray that you would bless each and every one here today. I pray that you would bless them as they go home. We pray for Growth Sunday next week. We pray that, uh, Father, that lots of people come and hear your word for the first time. And that they come into your kingdom. They become a precious son or daughter of the almighty God. Father, we love you today. We know that you are moving Thank you for Chance, who came up and and shared with us about the Homeless Youth Connection. Bless him and and bless their endeavors, Father. And let us as a church uh, be able to be a part of that. We love you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.